It's the 30th of June, and you're listening to Kopi Time, a podcast on economies and markets from DBS Group Research. I'm Taimur Beg, Chief Economist. Today, we will connect with London, England, where our guest is Professor Sir Charles Bean, an eminent name in the world of macroeconomics and central banking. I've known Charlie Bean since the early 1990s, when he was already a giant in the world of macroeconomics for undergrads at the London School of Economics. He soon went on to chair the Department of Economics there, and then in 2000, switched over from academia to central banking, joining the Bank of England, first as executive director for monetary analysis and statistics during 2000 to 2008, and then as the deputy governor for monetary policy during 2008 to 2014. Naturally, he was in the thick of things during the global financial crisis, representing the UK in the G7 and the G20 deputies forum. After leaving the Bank of England, Sir Charles came back to LSE on a part-time basis and for the last couple of years has also been a member of the Budget Responsibility Committee. Professor Bean, Sir Charles, welcome to Kopi Time. Very pleased to be here. Uh, Great to have you. Um, I want to begin today by referring to a blog piece that you put out both in Project Syndicate as well as on the LSE pages a couple of months ago, which was the title, um, uh, you know, quite perfectly, The Economics of Coronavirus. And the starting point, I suppose, would be springing from that article that, you know, what's your assessment of the ongoing downturn both in the context of the UK as well as you know, what's happening in the rest of the world. And I'd like you also to comment on the biggest issue of all, which is that I think we all agreed that the lockdowns were necessary, uh, but have the lockdown measures uh, given us enough time to deal with the pandemic going forward? Okay, well, we're obviously past phase one uh, of the pandemic, at least in, uh, say, the European countries uh, and uh, uh, some of the key countries in Asia, um, still obviously spreading now through uh, the Americas, uh, potentially uh, to Africa. Uh, and as you say, I think um, uh, from a health perspective, um, pretty severe lockdown measures were necessary at the outset because societies were, were not geared up, particularly this is true in Europe, where they've been planning for pandemic flu, but not ready for a SARS-type virus where um, different um, different issues arise, need for more ventilators and, uh, and so forth. But of course, the economic cost of those lockdown measures has been immense. Um, you know, in uh, the UK, we're looking at something like a 25% fall in GDP, peak to uh, trough, um, the government's economic measures um, have generally been geared towards trying to present unnecessary business failures um, on the premise that this um, hiatus in activity uh, was going to be largely temporary. Uh, you switch the economy off uh, for a while and then you, you reopen it. You don't want businesses that are available in the longer term to go bust in the interim. But of course, the key thing uh, is that we're now starting to come out of that very deep hole that we went into. And the unknown uh, uh, factor is how quickly economies will recover from that. Uh, And layered on top of that, of course, is that we're not at the end of the pandemic itself. As yet, we don't have an effective vaccine, effective treatments, and so forth. Uh, So there's likely to be uh, reappearances, second waves, things like that. Uh, And the central issue for managing the pandemic is obviously whether we've used the time that's been bought by the lockdown to put in place the measures that will enable us to uh, act in a more surgical fashion when we see resurgences. So particularly uh, testing, tracking, uh, and isolating people where there's um, uh, a resurgence. Um, And and that really will be uh, pretty central to the the next wave of the, the health measures, I think. On the economic side, um, as I say, the unknown is how strong the rebound uh, 
will be and to what extent government measures will be needed to support that recovery. There is quite a lot of commentary that rather takes it as, as given that there needs to be massive uh, supporting macroeconomic policies. I, I'm not sure that's necessarily true because the lockdown measures have depressed both demand and supply and to different degrees in different markets. Uh, and then as you take the, uh, the, the measures off, then so demand and supply come back potentially at different rates. And it's not clear that necessarily conventional macroeconomic stimulus will be what's required. It may need to be much more surgical, uh, maybe continued support for uh, those industries uh, that may have to wait much longer for uh, business to come back. Think theatres, uh, those sorts of things, maybe uh, the hospitality sector more generally. Um, and some may not come back at all, in which case the focus needs to be on facilitating the necessary structural change in the economy. Right. I think that's the critical issue here, that to what extent do we allow sort of, you know, crisis-led creative destruction to take place without necessarily undermining the entire recovery? Um, on the issue of uh, lockdown measures, um, I know... Hindsight is probably a bit too early to have. It's only been a few months of this uh, unprecedented measures. But do you think that, by and large, let's say at the G7 level, the fiscal and monetary response have been broadly in line with best practice? Well, I think it was quite interesting to see the contrast in approaches. So mostly in Europe, the focus has been on supporting people who are in jobs and keeping those jobs alive. So a good example of this is the, uh, the so-called furlough scheme in the uh, UK where uh, employee, employees who are on temporary layoff get 80% of their wages paid by the state. And that means that businesses uh, can keep them on the books instead of letting them flow into unemployment. Um, I mean, there's still some people who've... Um, fallen through the cracks, and we know that claims for uh, universal credit, which is essentially the, the unemployment benefit in the UK, that that has risen too. But uh, the primary focus was supporting people to stay in jobs. And other European countries have done similar sorts of things. Whereas in the US, you haven't had the same support of people within firms, but there's been much more support to households to um, bridge them through the period of unemployment. So much higher uh, rise in um, uh, joblessness over there. And then the key thing for the US will be whether they can create jobs quickly enough to absorb all those people back into an, uh, employment. Some of those might be with their former employer, but uh, a lot of them may not be. So there have been interesting differences of approach. Uh, I think it's too early to say uh, which has been uh, preferable. Um, like a lot of these things, it's, I think it's a mistake to form judgments on how successful different countries were in their approach until you actually got out the other side. Um, but I think, you know, it certainly wouldn't be true to say that everybody's done the same thing. There have been interesting differences. Uh, and of course, uh, even within the European countries, there have been different approaches. And say Sweden, for instance, uh, has taken a much less uh, directly interventionist approach to the way it's managed the pandemic. It hasn't closed bars and restaurants and relied much more on uh, people moderating their behaviour and reducing their social interactions. Um, so we'll see further down the road whether um, that has uh, produced a better economic outcome uh, for uh, maybe not too much more in the way of uh, uh, excessive deaths. Right. I think that's where, I mean, I think the Swedish example is going to be fascinating. I mean, it's a great experiment because we have sort of similar 
economies with similar characteristics right around Scandinavia, and they have pursued very different models. I, I find your point on the U.S. also very instructive because despite the U.S. sort of pursuing the model of, you know, if people are going to lay off, get laid off, let them get laid off temporarily, but they also have a paycheck protection program in place, uh, which is offering companies soft loans as long as you know, they keep uh, their workers on the payroll. And still, we have seen this big spike. Um, as you know, that you know here in Singapore, I think the big wisdom Singapore sort of acquired in the 08-09 crisis was that there is an asymmetry in the business cycle. Companies are very quick to fire, but not very quick to hire. So therefore, there is a role for public policy to play. And Singapore has sort of turbocharged that wisdom even further in the course of this pandemic, uh, providing businesses significant amount of incentives not to fire people willy-nilly. Um, so you're right. We'll see the, the, what, what the future holds. But I think Singapore, at least, is very much in the European camp. Uh, and also, again, learning from the 0809 crisis is to try to reduce the asymmetry of the business cycle as much as possible. Um, that, of course, takes me uh, to the issue of, sort of specific fiscal policy beyond just protecting people's paychecks, um, where do you stand in the sort of the balance between tax cuts and increasing transfers? Uh, and uh, if you were sort of, you know, designing fiscal policy at this juncture, uh, how would you tailor it? Uh, would it be any different from what's in place right now? Um, well, I think that the central question, um, which is facing governments going forward now during the recovery phase, uh, is the, the, uh, the question to what extent you need general demand stimulus as opposed to more targeted interventions. Uh, so certainly in the UK at the moment, there's quite a lot of suggestion around that the, the government should have a, uh, a cut in value-added tax, temporary cut in VAT, of the sort that we saw uh, during the Great Recession. Uh, and the idea there, obviously, is to encourage consumers to bring forward uh, spending to take advantage of the temporarily lower uh, sales taxes. Um, now, I'm, I'm not sure that that is necessarily right. It may turn out to be. Uh, but I think we need to get a little bit further through the recovery phase to see whether the issue is actually consumers are just not uh, willing to, to spend and they need a little bit of a kick? Or is the issue that people are still uh, wary about going back into the shops because of the uh, lingering concerns about the pandemic, in which case a, a VAT cut wouldn't, uh, uh, wouldn't facilitate things? Or it's quite possible that we may get quite a strong bounce back. Uh, one of the consequences of the way the lockdown period has been handled from an economic perspective is that lots of households actually have found their incomes have held up, but they haven't been able to spend, so they've been accumulating lots of savings. Uh, in general, we'll see the, the uh, savings rates have gone through the roof during this period. Um, so there's, there's some households uh, who are, you know, really have a lot of resources there that they, they might choose to go out and spend. Uh, so it may turn out that it's not really a lack of demand that's the, the problem. Uh, the issue may be much more in particular sectors where demand is slow to come back. So obviously parts of the hospitality sector, in which case you may still want to maintain uh, targeted uh, support measures for those sectors. So, say, a continuation of things like the, the furlough scheme in this country, but just for those industries, that might be one option. Or to the extent that you start seeing quite a lot of layoffs from uh, industries, from businesses that really don't have so much of a viable future in this uh, post pandemic world, then you want to be putting the resources into retraining, helping uh, workers um, uh, find new jobs, helping the young get onto the, the job ladder is particularly important because we know that there are, you have very long-term scarring effects if uh, people at the start of their working careers take a long time getting onto the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the job ladder. Uh, 
past. So uh, active labour market policies uh, and things which are much more targeted might be more appropriate. Now, I think at this stage, we don't really know what's the right balance between those options. So I think the important thing is that that uh, governments keep their options open. They want to make clear that they're um, uh, willing to take action as uh, conditions uh, unfold uh, and to you know attack with the wind uh, as circumstances dictate. What I think certainly is valuable though is for governments to continue to make clear they recognize that this is the sort of circumstance where it is appropriate for the state to step in. This is a, a major exogenous shock, a natural disaster, uh, and the state is the natural insurer of last resort in these circumstances. So it's perfectly appropriate to be letting the public finances take the strain. I think the scarring effect is a very critical one. I think we already have very good data from the 0809 crisis that the millennial generation that was unfortunate enough to enter the job market at that time, uh, the subsequent 10, 12 years have been pretty terrible for them in terms of their lifetime income potential mm -hmm. as well as their wealth levels. Uh, now we're going to have, I don't know how to define this next generation, maybe Generation Z or whoever are going to be entering the job market. Uh, they will have perhaps even greater predicament. And I fully concur with you that the state has a very large role to play in terms of both job placement as well as education. Uh, Professor Bean, now monetary policy. Uh, so we're all zero rate policy these days, whether you're in the UK or the US or Europe. And of course, there is negative rates elsewhere as well. Um, and all bets are off. Every single thing can be purchased and in unprecedented quantities. Um, Seems like the market is also fairly sanguine. When I look at you know five cross five inflation expectations, you know nobody's expecting inflation even ten years out, let alone two three years out. So are we in this free lunch phase right now? Well, we're certainly in a period where uh, rates look set to stay low uh, for a, a while. Um, now, of course, that may well change. I mean, the fact that. Uh, markets are having to absorb large quantities of extra public debt, um, if not immediately because central banks are absorbing some of it further down the road. Uh, so that um, may put some upward pressure uh, on the underlying natural rate of uh, interest in the longer term. We also know that demographics switching around with the bulge of baby boomers moving into retirement will be saving. So that might also put some uh, upward impetus uh, um, further down the road. Uh, these aren't necessarily things that will manifest themselves strongly immediately, uh, but I don't think we should take it as a given that interest rates are going to stay uh, at very low levels forevermore. Uh, what that means, I think, for, for governments is it makes sense for them to take advantage of the very low rates uh, that um, uh, are on offer now for the purposes of borrowing and lock that in. So borrow uh, for long periods um, uh, and um, you obviously want, this. hopefully, the central banks will be in a position to unwind some of the, the quantitative easing that they've done recently uh, in due course to uh, lengthen the maturity of the uh, consolidated public sector's um, liabilities. And that would help to uh, protect the public finances uh, against um, the extra cost that would be uh, generated if uh, interest rates, the underlying natural rate of interest were to start um, uh, edging up. Um, but as I say, I think it's a mistake to assume that uh, where we are now is going to be where we are forevermore. So this brings me to a somewhat thorny issue. I want to touch on the impact of monetary policy on asset price bubbles and that stuff in a moment, but I just want to transition from this point that um, if inflation has been so stable and so low under control for such a long time, 
why do uh, surveys of consumers show that you know they're sort of worried about you know their paychecks and affordability of certain things, and it's not just related to property prices, which arguably have been fairly high in much of the Western world as well as in East Asia. Are we measuring inflation correctly? Uh, of course, the argument can go both ways. That maybe inflation is even lower than we think because we don't measure the impact of Google and Apple phones correctly, or maybe we are not putting sufficient weight to rent and education and healthcare, cost of which have gone up. Uh, where do you stand on this issue? Well, I, I mean, certainly there's lots of issues involved in trying to get a suitable uh, measure of, uh, of prices. Um, this is not to criticize national statistical institutes. Um, you know, they do their best. Um, but uh, certainly issues of uh, quality measurement uh, are um, difficult to, to solve. So uh, particularly in the tech sphere, um, how you uh, quality adjust, uh, say, having a new phone. I mean, uh, phones get more expensive, but they have more things that they can, can do. So if you ask somebody in the street, they'll say, oh, you know, the phones are getting more expensive. But of course, the statistician is trying to correct for the fact that those uh, phones do much more now than they did in the, the past by using uh, suitable quality adjustment uh, techniques, which admittedly are, are, are difficult to do. Uh, but that's one reason for a, a divergence between the statisticians and sort of the man in the street view. Um, a second issue is there may be a whole bunch of things which are, are not being uh, properly captured, both in the national accounts uh, um, expenditure uh, measures, uh, as well as prices, and that's all to do with the um, uh, the digital economy and things which are delivered ostensibly free at, um, uh, at the consumer, but paid for in other ways through uh, being forced to consume parallel advertising uh, and the like. Uh, a third element is this point that there are uh, things like housing, which um, arguably not captured terribly well in a, a lot of countries, price indices. Um, uh, I think another element that might be worth adding is that one of the areas where you may be getting uh, very significant um, falls in prices according to the uh, official measures, uh, 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 often in uh, durables and uh, tech goods, uh, some tech goods, um, where people don't buy them very often. So they're not very conscious about what might be happening uh, to things that they buy infrequently, whereas stuff they go and buy regularly in the shops, they're more conscious about how the uh, price might change. Uh, and then there's a final thing that I would feed into this, which is apposite at the current juncture. So just in terms of assessing inflationary pressure uh, during the, uh, the recession uh, alongside the pandemic, is that there are some commodities that are just not available. So I think for the UK, something like 16% of the, uh, the basket that the Office for National Statistics samples in constructing uh, its measure of the consumer price index uh, have not been available through lockdown. Through lockdown. Um, and what do you do then? Well, if you follow the international protocols, you do it by uh, imputing the missing prices. Uh, now, there's a question about really, is that actually picking up what's going on? Well, people actually can't buy the stuff uh, at all. And maybe we ought to be changing the, the basket weights. Uh, but that's something that is not allowed under the, the international protocols that govern uh, pricing, you see. So that there's another sort of uh, short run measurement issue which may lead to um, uh, the official measures not giving a true picture. So lots of reasons, I think, to be uh, skeptical about to what extent uh, 
official measures of really capturing what's going uh, what, what's going on. But that said, uh, I still think they provide um, uh, a reasonably useful lodestar for central banks in setting their their monetary policy. Um, uh, you, you know, you can look at uh, things like nominal GDP, which might be uh, sort of more directly measured. A lot of these measurement issues that I've talked about don't really arise so strongly with nominal GDP. Uh, and you get the same sort of message about, yes, it's relatively uh, a relatively subdu subdued expansion in nominal magnitudes. Well, fair enough. So the caveats notwithstanding, you're broadly comfortable with the central banks in the UK, US, or Europe looking at around 2% inflation objective. Yeah, so there is an open question given the very low levels of the underlying natural uh, real interest rate and the idea that we might be in this world uh, of very low rates for at least some time to come, even if not indefinitely, uh, that uh, you want to give central banks a little bit more room to cut rates during downturns before they hit uh, wherever their effective lower bound is. Um, so uh, you have some people, Olivier Blanchard, of course, was one of the first people to advocate this, but he's not alone, uh, saying that, well, it would make sense to have uh, higher inflation targets. Um, uh, there's a cost to that. Um, uh, one of the virtues of um, targets of around 2% is that it's near enough to stable prices that people can largely forget about inflation. If you go to something like 4%, that's less true. And you lose the advantage of what my, uh, uh, my former boss, Mervyn King at Bank of England, uh, used to refer to as a stable prices heuristic. So there is a cost, but I think it's probably um, a, a costs that might be preferable to bear to some of the other alternatives that people uh, have talked about. Um, so relying more on negative interest rates, uh, uh, nominal interest rates and negative policy rates, uh, and introducing all sorts of ancillary uh, wheezes to try and prevent the associated squeeze on banks' profitability. Uh, or you've had Ken Rogoff suggesting that we should outlaw cash altogether, which would enable us then uh, to start um, uh, levying an interest charge on uh, whatever the currency medium is instead. This would obviously be much easier if there was a digital currency that was operated by the central bank. Uh, so, um, you know, there's alternatives if somehow or other you want to try and facilitate a low real interest rate. Uh, but maybe the easiest would be uh, a somewhat higher inflation target if it looks like we're in this uh, world of low real interest rates for many, many years to come. Right. I, I remember uh, talking to Olivier Blanchard about his um, uh, proposition years ago. Uh, I think the fact that, the, especially in the context of the Fed, you know, that they have not even managed to hit 2% target for many years um, and, and somehow still managed to maintain credibility, you think that it'll be a stretch for them to credibly hire, uh, go for a higher target. Um, let me ask you, and I want to touch on the digital currency, which is tantalizing in a minute, but let me ask you about the impact of all this asset purchase and exceptionally low inflation and low interest rates um, as far as financial stability is concerned. Asset price bubbles, uh, Japan-style zombification of certain parts of the economy. Uh, should we be worried about these issues? Well, I certainly think it's right to be worried about heightened financial stability risks. One of the, uh, the um, uh, adverse sides of having uh, very low uh, returns on safe assets is it encourages people to uh, move into other uh, riskier assets that uh, offer a higher return. Uh, 
um, and possibly lever up in the process to uh, try and raise those returns even more. Uh, now, some of that you want to happen. So if you think of quantitative easing, uh, uh, it's deliberately designed uh, if the central bank is buying government bonds to encourage the people who sell the government bonds then to use those proceeds to buy uh, a wider range of assets, equities, riskier corporate bonds and so forth, uh, reducing uh, the yields on those assets and encouraging businesses to invest more because it's uh, it's cheaper. That's the uh, uh, one of the channels of, of, of quantitative easing. But clearly, if you're going down this uh, this route, um, it does raise uh, um, um, more risks of episodes of financial instability, which is why it's not a very comfortable. Uh, place to be uh, for any sort of period. So I've always looked on um, policies like quantitative easing as being a part of the uh, the toolkit for emergency situations. You don't want it to be uh, the, the normal operating environment. Uh, and it's also one of the reasons why I think it would be desirable for governments to be looking for policies that will help to raise the natural real interest rate. So that includes obviously any policies that encourage investment, uh, reduce savings, um, change the relative preferences between safe, risky assets, uh, so forth. If we can get back to a world where the underlying interest rate, real interest rate, uh, is somewhat higher than those financial stability risks uh, will be less uh, less likely to crystallize. So it, it certainly is something that uh, that I worry about, and I worry about it before the financial crisis. Uh, so I was writing stuff when I was at the Bank of England, um, uh, considering whether it made sense for central banks to lean against the wind uh, during uh, upswings precisely because of this concern about um, financial instability risks that might be uh, building. But at the end of the day, it's really probably other policies, macro prudential policies, regulatory policies, and policies that help to raise the natural real interest rate uh, that may be the, the ones that you really want to look to. Not uh, You don't want to put give monetary policy too many uh, things to try and uh, deal with. Well, you and your colleagues at the Bank of England certainly spent the last decade and a half honing on that issue, that a broader set of tools be beyond just a blunt tool of interest rates. Uh, so there we definitely have hindsight, and you can look back and probably comment on whether the approach toward using macro and micro potential measures have been successful. So what report card would you give yourself for that? Well, I think the um, uh, uh, problem there is that we weren't applying those before the financial crisis. We hadn't really uh, appreciated the extent of the risks that were, uh, were building up. Um, it's not true that we were completely blind to them. So my colleague, Paul Tucker, for instance, uh, gave um, more than one speech um, uh, around about 2005, 2006, drawing attention to the risk of uh, associated what he called it vehicular finance at the time, basically off balance sheet vehicles and, and so forth. Uh, and of course, you have people like Raghu Rajan warning about um, uh, some of the risks that might be there. Uh, but to be honest, uh, on the Monetary Policy Committee, uh, I think we were focusing on the wrong sorts of risk. So we spent a lot of time debating whether the UK housing market was uh, was overvalued and not we were likely to have a, a house price crash. Uh, and also whether there was likely to be a big correction uh, in the dollar sterling exchange rate. Um, um, so they were the two things that we spent a lot of time talking about. 
uh, but um, uh, they, they, they weren't the dog that barked in the financial crisis. Uh, there was a housing crisis, but it wasn't really in the UK. It was in the, the US and then uh, um, had ramifications throughout the financial uh, systems uh, of the world and particularly um, uh, in the US and Europe. Um, on top of that, um, and this really is not a, a comment about the bank, because we no longer have supervisory uh, responsibilities at that time. Uh, we could issue sermons, but we didn't have any levers we could pull. Um, but with hindsight, clearly the banking system was not as resilient as it should be. It didn't have as much loss-absorbing capacity uh, as it does uh, now. Um, so, you know, there are obvious failings in the run-up to the crisis. Uh, since uh, the crisis, of course, we, uh, the landscape has changed. Uh, the Bank of England has had supervisory responsibilities returned to it. The whole macro prudential apparatus and the financial policy committee has been put in place. Uh, it has taken actions from time to time. Uh, I think I would say that it hasn't been fully tested because the key with these uh, innovations will be not so much, well, people can still remember the last financial crisis and there's lots of caution, but it's really in the, uh, when the good times get going again um, and the uh, macro credential authorities are trying to um, cool things, and you have the banks, the politicians, the public all saying, oh, you're worrying about nothing, everything's fine, we're better at controlling risks now, uh, and things um, uh, are getting out of hand. And I think the crucial thing will, will be whether those uh, levers are deployed effectively during uh, a, a, an outright boom phase again. Um, and we just haven't seen that sort of phase yet. Right. Um, you earlier touched on the possible role that digital currencies can play, uh, or rather central bank digital currencies can play in terms of you know, transmission of monetary policy or the um, implementation of, you know, deeply unconventional things like you know, deeply negative rates. Um, I know Bank of England has been at the forefront of this issue over the last seven, eight years, um, and I've had many conversations with your colleagues at the Bank of England about this. Um, your thoughts uh, in a pandemic like this, is this a great time to try out digital currency, have accounts for everybody and give them money that sort of loses its value in three months' time? Well, um, I mean, it's clear that the pandemic has hasten the move towards uh, a cashless society. Um, uh, and now, uh, that needn't necessarily be intermediated through the central bank, but, um, you know, there's arguments that you might want the central bank uh, to be at the centre of the, uh, the, the digital payments uh, mechanism. And if that's the case, then uh, you certainly have the option if everybody to all intents and purposes, is holding uh, a, 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 an account at the central bank, um, which in the old days would have just been um, impossible to imagine. I mean, it would, would have just been too much of a burden for the central bank mechanically to do that. Um, uh, with modern digitization, you might uh, imagine it, uh, it, it might be possible. And if you do that, uh, then it, clearly you can impose an interest cost on uh, that currency, uh, digital currency. Um, I have to say, though, that um, this is territory I would be very cautious about going into because uh, I don't think it is something that the public would take particularly kindly to. Uh, and if you're actually saying, well, we're going to introduce this digital currency, which will totally replace physical currency. Uh, oh, and by the way, we get to use that uh, essentially to tax your money holdings away. Uh, 
Um, I think that is something that um, uh, would lose the electorate's trust in their, their central bank. So uh, there may be a good case for a central bank digital currency, particularly if you're getting alternative private media being developed that may have issues about safety and so forth. Uh, but I, I uh, would be very wary about uh, going the next step and saying, oh, well, let's uh, use that uh, to enable us to levy a charge on holding that currency. No, you're right. I think that the prospect of digital currency is so tantalizing that we always sort of jump toward the most extreme possible usage, uh, whereas I think most central banks in the world are taking far more modest and prudent steps. Uh, we have been following China the last month or so, the whole ERMB issue, absolutely nothing to do with creating CBDC accounts for Chinese citizens. It's more about trying to wrest control of the payment and settlement system from the Alibabas of the world and get the base money to broad money transmission a little more transparently done. Uh, and I think in something like that, a centralized clearing system uh, at the retail level, I mean, at the wholesale level, of course, we've had it for maybe half a century now, uh, probably uh, makes sense. Um, so I, I want to touch on something that is not necessarily UK specific, but more of a global significance. But you know, you sat in the G7 and G20 for nearly a decade. So this is bread and butter for you. Um, the unprecedented injection in liquidity eventually finds its way to emerging markets. And I'm sure you've heard this narrative over and over again. And it's a too much of a plenty, and then we see asset price bubbles and uh, uh, exceptionally low rates supported by external flows in EM, and then during bad times like the way it was in March, they all go whooshing out, and then we have a liquidity and then eventually a solvency crisis. So I suppose I have two questions for you, that is that whether central bank monetary policy at the BOE or the Fed level or at the IMF World Bank level, um, how do we sort of, you know, look at this exceptionally low rates in the developed world and its unintended consequence for the rest of the world? So that's question one. And second question is more on the fiscal domain. Um, we probably will have debt repayment difficulties in certain emerging markets in the coming quarters. Uh, and again, not necessarily from a bilateral perspective, but from a multilateral perspective, do you think we need to start thinking about not just giving them cheap funding, but also maybe a big Paris Club type debt restructuring, debt forgiveness uh, program? Um, right, on the, the first of those, the, the monetary thing, of course, th this has been something that has bubbled along in ever since the wake of the financial crisis. Um, uh, uh, when Western central banks started engaging in quantitative easing. Um, so the, the initial phase of this focused on the exchange rate consequences, um, uh, and particularly uh, Guido Mantegna, the Brazilian uh, finance minister. Um, and I think there his criticisms were to some extent misplaced because he was, he focused on the consequences of uh, QE by particularly the Americans uh, on the exchange rate, but ignoring the fact that uh, although there might be uh, an expenditure switching effect coming through that way, QE was also increasing the overall demand uh, in the, the world economy as well as in the, the US. Uh, so there was a, an expenditure increasing measure. But the more important criticism, I think, has come later. So uh, Raghu Rajan, uh, in um, uh, particular, was vocal in the, the G20 with this argument. And it's been subsequently uh, developed in the academic sphere by people like Ellen Ray uh, and so forth. Uh, which is that um, you have these important uh, capital flow consequences um, with uh, capital flowing into emerging markets um, when uh, the Fed relaxes monetary policy um, and then all flows out again when the Fed reverses policy. And those very large uh, swings in capital flows are very difficult to manage. Uh, and I think that is a, a, a very valid point and 
uh, led to a change in the way the IMF viewed capital controls, that there was, if you like, this new view of capital controls as essentially a macro prudential uh, instrument to try and avoid the fiscal, uh, sorry, the financial uh, instability consequences that you might get from these, uh, these big swings in, in capital flows. Now, the question is to what extent uh, the, uh, the central banks um, in the advanced economies should take account of And really, when I say central banks, it's actually the Fed that we're talking about. It doesn't really matter too much what the Bank of England does. And frankly, really, even the ECB, because it's not yet that major reserve currency. Uh, you know, the, the dollar is still dominant in the, um, uh, the global financial system. So it's the Fed. Um, now, the, the Fed has developed this mantra. Well, they, they take account of not over spillover, take account not only of spillovers, but spillbacks and so forth. But the, the really central question here is should Fed m monetary policy take account directly not only of its impact on the US, but also on other countries in how it frames its policy. And that may, might mean, for instance, accepting the policy would be kept tighter in the US and more unemployment there and so forth, in order to avoid these uh, spillover effects on other countries, particularly in emerging and developing uh, economies. Um, and the problem here is that you run into the political economy of it. I don't think the Fed could really unilaterally say it was going to do this without uh, getting pushback from, uh, uh, from the politicians in the US. And particularly, I have to say, given the, the more populist um, uh, president that we have in the White House uh, now, uh, so even though from a, a benevolent global dictator point of view, you might see an argument for why the Fed should have this broader view of who it was setting monetary policy for. So not just for the um, uh, for US citizens. I think in practice, uh, we are stuck in a world where uh, I can't remember who it uh, was said, uh, the dollar's our currency, but your problem. Uh, I think that is, is one that inevitably will be with us. Uh, so we're in the second best world where uh, in, in emerging market uh, countries and developing economies just have to use other tools at their disposal to try and uh, mitigate the risks from these swings in capital flows when they occur. On the other question you ask about the, uh, the uh, uh, fiscal side, so recognising that as we come out of the pandemic, um, we may well find some countries are struggling to meet their uh, debt obligations. Uh, uh, should we recognise there may need to be uh, degree of debt forgiveness, restructuring, whatever, I think the answer is yes. And there have been some people uh, who have sort of been quite vocal that the, uh, the G20 needs to be putting in place the mechanisms uh, that would help support uh, poorer countries that, uh, that find themselves in difficulty, both in fighting the pandemic, so giving them the additional resources for health systems and so forth, but also um, providing uh, debt forgiveness, restructuring, uh, whatever. Unfortunately, again, the, uh, some of the key political actors at the moment uh, are much more focused on national interests rather than international interests. Um, but uh, this, is, this is somewhere I think uh, an internationally agreed approach would be desirable. Well, speaking of national versus international interest, uh, perhaps our concluding point be about Brexit. Uh, 
um, UK post Brexit, post pandemic, uh, where are we going? Um, well, uh, it's difficult to see the, through the fog, obviously, of how the uh, pandemic will unfold. And frankly, uh, the uncertainties around Brexit are small compared to the uncertainties about uh, the pandemic and its economic uh, consequences. Um, uh, I mean, it's still unclear where the uh, negotiations about our trading relationship with uh, uh, the, the rest of the EU will end, end up. Both sides want an agreement, but are not prepared to have an agreement at any price. Uh, my expectation is that they'll probably uh, at least conclude agreements in some areas um, and there may be uh, further agreements uh, further down the road. What I hope will be avoided is any unnecessary disruption uh, to both the UK and the EU when we finally leave the, the transition period uh, at the end of, uh, of this year. The UK government said it doesn't want to extend it. So I, um, it would be unhelpful to have a, a further dislocation uh, since there will already be the issue of, of dealing with uh, the, the pandemic and the economic consequences of it. Um, what I also uh, hope uh, is that um, the UK and the EU um, have a, a good relationship going forward once the, uh, the UK has left. But the problem with divorces is that, you know, sometimes they end up as being acrimonious despite uh, the, the husband and wife saying that, uh, you know, they intend to uh, retain cordial relationships and both give access to the children. Um, but it will be nice to hope that, you know, after the divorce is finalised, that uh, we can live on good cooperative terms. Well, um, as uh, witty and as insightful as ever, uh, Professor Charles Bean, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I think that's basically the perfect way to end this talk. You're very welcome. Good talking to you. Uh, thanks to our listener for listening in. Uh, you've been listening to Kopi Time. Uh, you can find all our research in multimedia by Googling DBS Group Research. <laughs>